my plan for last time was to was to give you a little bit of a, a taste of how to do a um, how to embed a simply typed lambda calculus in in F star. Um, this file is there. This OPLSS STLC FSD is there in my course notes. I'm going to skip it. I think I, I, I um, it's it's fairly kind of textbook and uh, you can follow it. It's quite well. It's commented in, in in detail. If you have questions about it, do ask me. But I think I'll move to showing you instead about how to embed a um, an assembly language in F star and starting first with some um, some motivation about it. So. Um, So one of the things we've been use, doing in XTAR is, is implementing cryptography um, and uh, uh, both cryptographic protocols as well as primitives and implementing them efficiently, correctly, and securely. And, um, and the reason we've been targeting crypto is that first, it's hard to get right. And it's also critical to the security of the entire software stack. Um, there are some other reasons also why it's, it's, a, it's a useful proposition to target cryptography as a um, for, for program proof. The, one of them is, is that there's kind of a widely perceived wisdom in the software community that you shouldn't be rolling your own crypto. You should leave crypto uh, to experts. And so uh, there are a few um, uh, implementations of certain cryptographic primitives that are worth targeting and, and replacing. And there aren't like thousands of implementations of these things that there's, there's uh, and people are willing to take code provide, uh, built by experts uh, when it comes to crypto. Um, crypto code is unfortunately has has uh, you know is uh, has been buggy. The, for instance, there have been bugs in implementations of elliptic curves, um, even in supposedly simple pieces of uh, algorithms that are designed to be simple, like poly one through five. There have been bugs in them. Um, uh, computing the wrong results, and even AES-GCM, which is a hardware-accelerated implementation of authenticated encryption, and is this this particular construction is used by something like ninety percent of all secure internet connections these days. So it's it's a really really sort of this particular construction, uh, this algorithm is 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 really kind of the backbone of security uh, uh, across the internet. Even this has had um, uh, implementation bugs. So why are there these implementation bugs in in uh, crypto uh, in, uh, in, in cryptography? Uh, well, at, in its typically uh, the way a, a uh, cryptographic construction of a primitive is, is described is using some uh, some uh, you know abstract mathematics. It's usually say computing evaluating evaluating a polynomial in some field or something. It has a fairly concise mathematical description. Now, to implement it efficiently, there's um, the, this uh, this mathematical specification is turned into an algorithm, and the algorithm to do it efficiently can be quite verbose, and there may be many steps to it, and that makes um, the the algorithm can be quite far from the from the math. And what then makes it even harder is that to really get this to go fast, people implement the algorithm in low-level languages like assembly, playing lots of tricks, bit twiddling tricks and uh, uh, pipelining tricks and so on. And, and this piece of assembly code is the reality in, in, in some sense, the thing that actually runs. So in order to prove this code correct, you need, you need to somehow take the assembly code that runs and show that it's a refinement of this algorithmic specification. And then to show that this algorithm is actually a refinement of the nice math that you started with. And the gap, I mean, and this is this is non-trivial to do because, I mean, just textually, the gap between this nice mathematical spec and the assembly implementation that you actually run is is actually quite large. So it's useful to try to build tools to to uh, prove these uh, these kinds of refinements, and that's what we we've, we've done. Uh, we have a tool called Veil for verified assembly language for Everest, and it's a deeply embedded assembly language in F star that's geared towards doing proofs about cryptography. Uh, the way it works is that uh, there is a specification in F star that's uh, that's kind of the the math the you know this description of uh, evaluating a polynomial or something from depending on the on the particular construction you're using, and there is an implementation uh, and that's the 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 math is specified just as pure functions in F star. Uh, you can actually compile this pure function as a, a OCaml executable and test it if you like. 
Um, and then there's a uh, there's a uh, this, there's the, the algorithm that kind of an implementation blueprint is also written in FSTAR and proven to be a refinement of the of the spec. And then there's there finally there's the assembly implementation, the code that you actually want to run. So we have a tool. This Veil tool is a has its own syntax. It's a front end built on top of FSTAR that gives you a kind of a procedural language in which to write assembly uh, small assembly programs. Uh, with specifications, so you can write a procedure that's got whose body is uh, are these instructions here, these assembly instructions. Uh, but uh, this it's an assembly language decorated with you know uh, 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 the ability to state lemmas and invariants and preconditions and postconditions and so on. Um, and this uh, assembly language is is translated to FSTAR, and a proof is done in FSTAR about the correctness of uh, of that code. We actually have, a, a, I mentioned yesterday that we also have a C-like um, uh, embedding, a shallow embedding in, in FSTAR that we can also use to do crypto proofs. Um, uh, but for this assembly code, once you've verified the assembly code in FSTAR, you can just print the body of that. Of that um, there's an FSTAR program that just takes the content, the computational content of a program, the instructions that it contains, and just simply prints it as an assembly file, which can then be uh, compiled, uh, you know, assembled using your favorite assembler. So what do we actually verify? So we prove uh, basically that we, as a baseline, you have to prove safety, memory and type safety. Uh, we also prove functional correctness, meaning that our, uh, our low level implementations, the assembly code um, computes the same functions, behaves functionally the same as the high level mathematical spec that, we, uh, that we're aiming for. And we prove secrecy, uh, meaning uh, that uh, um, at the access to the way in which we access secrets like keys and, and private data is restricted per the design of the protocol. Um, and since everything is all in, uh, it, all the proofs are done in a single framework, all in F star, there is the, the this connection that, you know, is um, it, it, it's, it's all checked mechanically. There's no way for the spec and the implementation to drift. So we used our tool, we've used it to uh, veil to implement several crypto algorithms, including uh, this AES GCM implementation. And here's some, and our implementation is actually really fast. So uh, here's to give you a sense of, you know, uh, where verified cryptography is these days. So since, um, uh, since in the last maybe, uh, I guess now it's eight years or so, seven, eight years, people have been looking at building verified implementations of cryptography for a while. And there's been, you know, we've been making steady progress, uh, trying to uh, ver build fast verified implementations of crypto primitives. Um, and this line, this green line up here has been the performance of OpenSSL's unverified AES-GCN uh, for a long time. So they've been going at about six and a half gigabytes uh, per second, um, uh, being able to authentic uh, do authenticated, authenticated encryption at at that speed. And that's been unverified code for a long time. And verified implementations of uh, similar things, like in 2018, we had a popple paper where we had an implementation of, of AES-GCN that reached one gig per second, and we were happy about that. But it's still a long ways off of the unverified code. And then uh, two years ago, at this point, we, we implemented um, all the optimizations that are there in OpenSSL, plus a couple, some, a couple more, in fact. And our performance of um, AES GCM is now on par with, if not, you know, a tiny bit better than um, than the best unverified code. So, uh, what I wanted to say was that you know, verification does not need to impose a performance overhead. You can uh, you can prove all the all the um, the optimizations that that are needed in practice. Um, so the way this works is. Uh, as I sketched earlier, there's, there is this veil source language that has a, uh, a syntax. And there's an untrusted tool, a, a veil to F star translator that is going to translate this, that parses this code and then translates it to F star, um, to a deep embedding in F star. So for some of you who may not be familiar with this, there's, there's this distinction between deep and shallow embeddings. In, um, a deep embedding is when you take a, 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 a programming language that you're interested in, uh, say it's uh, an assembly language or a lambda calculus or, or whatever, and you're going to embed it in another language. And the way in which you're going to do that embedding is that you're going to embed the syntax of that other language, of the languages you're interested in, into your proof assistant. You're going to have an abstract syntax tree to represent 
the, the, the programming language that you're trying to formalize. And then you're going to give a, sem a semantics to that abstract syntax tree by, for instance, defining an interpreter for programs in um, um, interpreter over the syntax of those, of, of those programs. So that's what, um, that's what we do with Veil. We embed the syntax of Veil in FSTAR and we give it a semantics. And that semantics is given against a machine model that includes a, um, a big step interpreter for these instructions. Uh, and then uh, we do proofs in FSTAR about the semantics of these embedded programs. Okay, and I'm gonna show you in, in a second a demo of how that works. And then uh, what, what happens is that as in the process of giving a semantics to, to, to Veil and FSTAR, we given an individual a specific Veil program, we can in FSTAR compute a verification condition for it and, and then solve that verification condition in FSTAR using a variety of techniques, including feeding it to Z3. So, um, so here, let me switch to some code now. Is there, um, I, I can take a couple of questions at this point, if there are any. Otherwise, I'll, 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 I'll keep going. Um, um, so, so this file, which is also uh, up, up there on my course notes is uh, a, a mini veil in some sense. It's, it's a, a tiny representative sample of what veil is and embedded in FSTAR. The way that we're I'm gonna sorry. do this, this embedding is- I'm sorry, Nico. Can we yes. pause? The, there is an interesting question in the chat whether a whale can state and thus prove uh, time and properties like constant time implementation of the cryptographic primitives or any functions uh, for that matter. There are, yes, we do have a, a tool that is a, a, um, an analysis of veil programs that can prove them uh, a constant time. Yes, we do. So um, uh, this is described in our veil popple paper. Uh, there's a link to it on, on my course notes. Super cool, thanks. Uh, so, um, so, the, so the way in which we're going to do this is uh, we are going to, in my tiny assembly language here, I'm going to have just two instructions, okay? I'm going to have a move and an add. And uh, I'm going to work over 64-bit uh, words. So uh, uh, my representation of machine words is going to be a NAT64, that's an, an integer between 0 and, uh, and 2 to the 64, okay? That's going to be my machine words. And I, my instructions are just moves and adds. And um, there are two kinds of operands. An operand can either be a register or it can be a constant, okay? And uh, my program is going to be a, a, uh, a, an element of this type called code. And it's either gonna be a single instruction or it's going to be a block of instructions. Or and, and over here, I'm gonna work with a, a structured assembly language where rather than uh, uh, encoding labels and jumps and so on, I'm going to have a while loop in my assembly language, okay? So this is a while the operand is, while source one is less than source two, uh, keep executing the body, okay? Um, so now I'm gonna give a semantics to this. So, so far, I've only defined the syntax of my assembly language. And now I'm going to give a, uh, a semantics to it. And the way I'm gonna give a semantics to it is first by defining what the state of the program is. And the state of the program is going to be just its register file. So it's gonna be a, uh, the register file is a map from registers to their current values. And reg is just um, in this model, I have four registers, RAX, RBX, RCX, RDX, okay? Um, and uh, I'm gonna give a, a big step semantics to my program, but it's gonna be a fueled semantics because I, I have my while loops a priori may not terminate. So I'm gonna fuel my semantics to ensure that I have at every reduction of the while loop, the, the fuel decreases, I can prove it terminating. And then I'm going to force programmers who are writing in Veil to prove that there exists a fuel amount that is that is appropriate for their program. So every Veil program is gonna be proven terminating. Okay, so, but the way I'm gonna define the semantics is to fuel it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I, I do some, I have some basic, uh, um, basic functions like to evaluate an operand. Uh, evaluating a constant is just returning the value of the constant. Evaluating a register involves looking up the, the, the value of that register in the current state. And here's a way to update a register too. So um, 
Okay, uh, I'm going to assume that I uh, I have a an unknown state. Just to keep things simple, I'm not going to encode failure as an option. I'm just going to have a distinguished state that I that I'm that my interpreter is going to return in case the program gets stuck. Okay, uh, assume is a, a feature in F star that you can use. Uh, it you know it's it's declaring an assumption. Uh, F star ID the Emacs mode will highlight it in red, um, and uh, it just tells. So you're, you're free to use this, but uh, you know you should be careful when you use and assume. You should not assume false clearly. Uh, so uh, here is my my the, the semantics of my embedded language. It's a I'm going to define a a big step interpreter. First, um, I'm just going to evaluate that eval ins is an evaluator for a single instruction. Okay, and it's going to uh, if I it's and this is encoding some of the errors. So if I try to move a constant. I can't move a constant, so I'm just going to return unknown state. But if I try to move a, a, uh, a register, some value into a register, well, then I can actually move, do the move. Um, um, so that, that's my implementation of uh, single instruction evaluation. And then with that, I can define evaluation for uh, uh, entire programs. And the way I'm going to do it is that if I have an, a single instruction, I can, I can take a step and evaluate it. Um, and here's a bit of mutual recursion going on. Um, if I have a block of instructions, well, I evaluate them uh, in sequence. And here's the implementation of a while loop. Um, if I've run out of fuel, then I stop. Uh, otherwise, I evaluate the operands. And if, if one is less than the other, then I continue evaluating the body and loop, reducing the fuel. Otherwise, I, um, I stop, OK? Uh, I hope that's clear enough. I went fairly quickly, but I hope you. If there are any base, if you don't understand something, you can ask me now about this. Um, so the the first lemma. So now now that I have my semantics, I can start to prove things about my semantics. Okay, um, I've defined my language. Now I want some properties about my language. The first property I'm going to prove, prove about my language is that the fuel doesn't matter. So the, um, what this is saying is that if I take a, a program, C, and I've evaluated in some state S0 with some fuel value F0, and I got some result, Sn, then if I evaluate it with some fuel greater than F0, Fn, then the result doesn't change, meaning the fuel is just there to control how, uh, you know, uh, if I give a program more fuel than it needs, it doesn't change the result. Okay, that's the first property I proved about my program. And it's a proof, it's a lemma, it's a proof by induction over the structure of the, of the program. Okay. Um, now, uh, from, uh, from this, uh, this, this lemma, I can, I can show, I can define a function, um, a pure function that's going to compute the fuel needed to run a program. And the, um, the way it works is that if I'm given a, a, uh, a um, if I know that I need a, a certain amount of fuel F0 to run a, a, uh, a, piece of, uh, a piece of code C, and I need FM to run some continuation CS, then to, to evaluate both of them together, I need, um, I'm going to compute the fuel that I need some value of FN, that's the value returned by this program, to evaluate the block C followed by CS. And I can compute that um, by basically taking the maximum of F0 and Fn. Okay, and I can prove that this is this is enough to run a run this block. Now to to um, to actually prove programs that I'm uh, in this embedded language, I'm going to define a few basic lemmas that are going to give me a, a way to reason about moves and adds. These are the two instructions I have in my program, move and add. So I'm going to define some lemmas to work with them, and um, uh, these lemmas are actually stated in a form which, which is, uh, notice rather than the lemma keyword, I'm using this, this pure keyword here, meaning that this, this function returns a value. It's not just returning unit, it's returning state cross fuel um, with some conditions about it. Meaning that, um, so, so the, the, the property of move is that I, if I try to evaluate a move from uh, source to dest in a state S0, uh, I'm going to get some state SM where uh, uh, um, uh, 
uh, the the final state SM, this is the interesting part, is um, the update of the initial state S0 with the uh, contents of the destination register uh, uh, taken from SM. Okay, so it's mutating just the, uh, the destination register in S0. Okay, and I can prove this lemma about move, and I can prove a similar lemma about add, giving the semantics for add in terms of uh, its operations on the state. And, and now I have some I have the gadgets I need to prove properties about my program. Um, so if I if I have a, a given program and my program here is um, say doing a move um, uh, and then doing two ads, if I if for this particular program I might want to prove that for instance if I'm running in an initial state where um, where uh, rex is less than hundred. Then I'm going to end in a final state where the value of RBX is three times the value, the initial value of RAX. Okay, that's. Uh, I hope this is, this is a. You believe that this is true about this program. I'm going to um, uh, move RAX into RBX, add it once, and add it again, and store the result in RBX. So, um, so that's what the specification is saying. That if I evaluate the program this code's triple program in the initial state, I get some final state. The value of RBX in the final state is three times the initial value of RAX. And this last bit is saying that um, the, only, uh, the only registers that changed were RBX. I didn't touch any of the other registers. So I can do such a proof. And the way I can do this proof, and this is kind of a naive proof a, it, uh, about this program, is, is to specifically invoke the lemmas that I've defined previously that are giving me the semantics of move and add. And I can show that, well, after the move, my state is S2. And then if I do an add in S2, the state is S3. And if I do an add in S3, the state is S4, and so on. And finally, I can call my merge lemmas to tell me how much fuel I need to evaluate this whole thing. And this is sufficient to convince F star that this property is true about my program. Okay, so I've just done a proof about these three, the, ex the execution of these three instructions on my little machine. Okay. Um, it's probably a lot to swallow, but it, you know, it's a, I, I, my goal with these is to give you enough of an impression of what the code is doing, so that you can go and read the code carefully and 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 try to you know make more sense of it independently. So do ask questions. Thank you. So you, yeah, is this, is this a proof uh, for the given program wherein we are doing only uh, transfers between the registers A and B, um, or because I think we started off saying that we are trying to prove that. Uh, proof for all programs that we can find a finite uh, unbounded value of u l. Ah, the, so there are two things that went on. So first, I, uh, I maybe I should have been clear about that. So the the property about fuel, we proved for any program, for any program on this on this uh, uh, that runs on this machine, if it runs uh, with, successfully with the sum amount of fuel f zero, it will run producing the same result with the greater amount of fuel, and that proof was done once and for all. For all programs. Now I'm interested in proving properties about specific programs. Um, and here I picked this really simple specific program, but you can imagine that this program could, the specific program could be an implementation of AESGCM. And then I want to prove that AESGCM is actually computing some evaluation of some polynomial. And that's how you would do, you know, uh, I mean, it's a lot bigger, but this, that, the spirit of it is, is similar. Okay. Thank you. Right, so um, uh, so actually, so now you may look at this and say, well, um, that's a lot of proof to write for a simple program like this. Like I wrote three instructions. It's a really trivial program, but to do its proof, I had to write, you know, I had to explicitly invoke all these lemmas, call these merge functions. It's a, it's a pretty verbose proof for such a tiny program. So in fact, what we do in Bail is to not do proofs this way. And here's the um, a second program, a second uh, uh, demo, where I'm going to build on the first one. And here, instead of um, uh, instead of uh, you know requiring the programmer to explicitly call these lemmas to complete the proof, what I'm going to do here is to define instead a verification condition generator for a bail program, a, a, a procedure in F star that is going to compute. A, a, um, a formula 
a logical formula, which if you can prove that if, if that formula is valid, then you can conclude that the user provided spec about that program is also valid. So that, that this, is, this is going to allow us to automate these kinds of proofs in, in, a, um, uh, in a simpler way. So um, the way in which we're going to do this and is, um, uh, so when you're computing verification conditions for programs, you typically do this in a, um, in a semantics for programs that, that give programs a predicate transformer semantics. Usually this means that you're give, if you're given some post condition about your program, that's some property that you want to prove about your program when it, when it terminates, when it exits, given such a post condition, can you compute a precondition for the program such that if the initial state validates that precondition, then the program is guaranteed to end in the final state while validating your post condition, the one that you gave to it. So that's this kind of weakest precondition or predicate transformer semantics for, for a program. And what we're gonna do for Veil is to give it such a semantics. So we're going to compute for, for, for Veil uh, weakest preconditions of this form. The type of a weakest precondition is going to be a function from post conditions to preconditions. And a post condition and a precondition are both just um, predicates on states, on veil states. State error prop is a post condition. State error pre is a is a is a precondition. Uh, for, ignore for a moment these q error things. Are, I'm going to use them to control how star normalizes code, and that's going to give me some some uh, some way to do um, to automate proofs. But ignore it for the moment. I'll explain it in a minute. So. Uh, with that as the type of, of uh, my weakest precondition predicate transformers, I'm going to define a judgment um, for veil programs. And my judgment is going to look like this. It's going to say a piece of code has a WP uh, for some WP. And this, this, this main judgment is going to be defined this way. It's, it says for any post condition, K, and any initial state S0, um, I can compute a final state and some fuel such that if I can prove the weakest precondition for my post condition, okay, applied to the initial state, given the precondition, this function is successfully going to return state and fuel such that the, the program, when evaluated with that fuel on the initial state, is going to give some final state, SM, and SM is going to validate the post condition K that I'm interested in. Okay. Um, so, uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to augment every instruction in my program with a proof of its own weakest precondition. So this is, I'm kind of defining a small type class here uh, where a type class is going to associate a, a code an instruction with a weakest precondition for that piece, for that piece of code and a proof that in fact, this WP is a valid weakest precondition for that piece of code. Okay, and uh, now I can uh, lift that in, uh, uh, if I have uh, weakest preconditions for individual uh, instructions, I can lift that into a weakest precondition for a collection of instructions uh, like, like so. And I can define a verification condition generator for my program that is basically going to take a list of codes and a proof that, um, that those codes have certain WPs. And then for a given post condition, it's going to compute the, um, the weakest precondition of this list of codes with respect to that post condition. And the way it's going to do it is that if my friends, so let's look at this a little bit. So the, the way this is going to do it, it's going to say, uh, if, um, if, my, um, uh, if, I, if my program is empty, then I simply have to prove the post condition on the initial state. The empty empty program is a no op, nothing changed. So I have to prove my post the initial state and the final state are the same. So I should just prove my post condition about the initial state. Otherwise, what I have to do is to um, is you should kind of read this a little. Um, these these weakest precondition semantics kind of work backwards. So so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the the weakest precondition of the tail of the program with respect to my post condition. And then whatever I get, I'm going to feed that to the to the weakest precondition of the head instruction and apply that to the initial state. So I'm kind of pushing the weakest precondition through the tail of my program. Um, you could ignore Q lemma for the moment. It's a it's a way to inject um, uh, additional logical payload into uh, into a, a veil procedure. 
Um, and then I can prove a lemma that says this verification condition generator that I just defined is in fact sound. And the way that works is, is to say that if for a given program in a post condition, if my verification condition generator computed some precondition, then it's the right one. It means that if I evaluate my program on the initial state, I get some final state and the post condition is true of that final state. Okay, so now that I, I, I have a verification condition generator and I've proven it sound, I can make use of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, uh, first build type class instances for each of my instructions. So, so I'm going to say, uh, you know, um, my move instruction, this is my instance for move. For move. My move instruction uh, is going to be packaged with its WP that I defined here and a proof that this WP is in fact the WP of move. And I'm going to, my instructions all now all come with their own WP um, uh, combinators. And with that in hand, and I do a similar thing for, for, for add, and now, now what I can do is to say, um, uh, I can instruct F star, th this here is a way to get F star to run my VC generator on a particular veil instruction, a sequence of veil instructions. So this norm here is, a, so uh, as I mentioned yesterday um, briefly, the, um, I showed you this assert norm, which is a way to get F star to reduce computations on its, on its abstract machine. This is an inst another instance of that. This is saying, um, in order to prove a particular program correct, compute th this this uh, procedure here is saying compute its verification condition generate uh, its verification condition using the VC generator that I just defined, and reduce this VC generator. Run the VC generator on the abstract machine to get a you know to, to compute to get its actual the logical formula that corresponds to its verification condition uh, its ver its verification condition, and if you do if you can do that, then you can conclude that. Um, uh, the property that you want. You can conclude that the post condition is true of the, of the final state. So now with this in hand, when I write programs, instead of just writing uh, uh, the, the three raw instructions, I'm going to write a sequence of instructions that are packaged with their WPs. And now to prove my program, rather than writing those lemmas by hand, I can run my VC generator. It's going to compute a, a, a verification condition and I'm just going to feed that verification condition to, to Z3, and it's going to um, it's going to prove this program automatically. So that went pretty quickly. Um, I think to really understand this in, in detail, I, I recommend that you see our um, our uh, uh, there's a the, the popper paper that I mentioned describing how this works. Uh, but the, what I wanted to convey to you was that having given a semantics to a language embedded in F star, deeply embedded in F star, you can start to define tools for reasoning about those programs, including, for instance, defining proof automation procedures like the one I just showed. Okay, and there are other tools you can define too. So for instance, there was, there was a question about uh, uh, constant time and uh, side channel analysis and so on. Well, the way we implement that is to define, is to define an analysis on the semantics of veil programs embedded in F star. And that analysis is a verified program in F star that shows that if that analysis returns true, then in fact, the veil program does not leak any secrets um, by doing a relational analysis of veil programs. And so you can build tools, certified tools about the embedded programs in F star and run them. Um, so uh, let me pause there for a second. I realized I kind of went, um, uh, compared to yesterday's intro lecture, I went much uh, faster. I um, um, hope I didn't leave too many of you behind, but do ask questions if you have any. All right. Um, so, uh, so that was that was about how to embed uh, 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 deeply embed programming languages in F star. And now I'm going to switch tack a bit and talk about how to do effectful programming in F star. So far, all that we've seen has been you know programming with pure functions and uh, and lemmas and so on. But uh, you know um, uh, how can you embed full fledged effectful programming languages in F star? Things that are going to do I/O or uh, uh, raise exceptions or uh, uh, read state or diverge things like this um, and 
the the general approach to doing this in F star is is as follows: you 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 program libraries to model effects. So what is an effect? An effect is some kind of observable behavior of a program at runtime. Maybe it's uh, like things like reading the state and so on. So I'm I'm going to give uh, actions in F star for describing these these uh, effectful primitives, things like read, write, or uh, fork, join, and so on. I'm going to model them in the logical fragment of F star, and then uh, F star provides a, a mechanism that allows you to package these models up into an abstraction that uh, presents to a program an effectful interface to these these uh, logically modeled uh, primitives. And then you can write programs against these models and verify them with um, a notion in F star called refined computation types, which I'm going to teach you about in a second. Um, and having done such such uh, uh, programs and proofs, you can then you can compile your program in, in various ways. Just compile them to OCaml or C or uh, F sharp or, or and and what uh, in the process of doing this, the uh, one thing that we do is that we these primitive actions that we modeled in our programs, like uh, say uh, some way to um, uh, fork a thread. We gave it a model in our program. Um, we are going to then map these things to the to our assum uh, to assumptions about, um, uh, say, a, uh, a, prim a the system implementation of threads on the particular platform that we're running on. Okay, so that's that's broadly the the, the game the, the, that we play here. So so something it, a program may look something like this. You have a, say you want to write a program to increment a reference. You're going to uh, do something like this. You're going to have you, in F star. You'll be able to write a program that that takes a reference R. You're going to give it a specification, and the specification is going to say this ST is a label that says that this program may read or write the state and return a unit. But in doing so, um, it, you can write a specification that says, well, it's going to transform the state from H zero to H one, and it's going to transform it in this particular way. It's going to say that the final value of, of uh, R in H1 is the initial value of R in H0 plus one, and that this, this program modified only R. You can write a, such a spec about it, and the implementation is just going to be what you expect for incrementing a reference. Now, when you compile this program to ML, you can compile it to just references in, in ML, or and when you're compiling it to C, you can compile it to pointers in C. Um, and, um, uh, and we have tooling to let you do that. Okay, so um, uh, so uh, so to tell you about these this idea of refined computation types, I need to tell you about um, uh, a distinction in F star between values and computations. So values in F star are unconditionally total terms. These are things like you know the the values that we've seen so far, things like you know zero or length of a list or and so on. These are just uh, uh, total things. Um, and there are two classes of types in F star. There are value types, which are all the types we've seen so far, like int and bool and unit and so on. These are the types that we give to, to pure total values in F star. And then there's another class of types called computation types. And computation types um, are uh, the types that we give to um, potentially effectful computations. Things, uh, so, so I mentioned yesterday that a uh, tote is a computation type. It's a special case of a computation type where it so happens that the computation is total. But there are other kinds of computation types, things that could diverge, things that could read or write the state, uh, and so on. And this language of computation types is open to the user. It's a, it's a, you can define your own new computation types. And each computation type is used to describe some effect in your program. Um, and the general form of, of the so far only the pure ones. The general form is that it uh, a program uh, an arrow looks like this. It takes a, a an argument x of type t, where t is a value type, and on the right hand side of the arrow you have a computation type. So this says that a function. Uh, so, so one way to understand this is, is that f star is a call by value language. So a function receives arguments that are values. And it computes a result, and the and in doing so, it may have some effects, and th those effects are described by C. Okay. Um, 
so just as we had refinement, refined value types, the ones we saw yesterday, things like NAT and so on, um, which are refinements of integers, that's refined value types. We also have a notion of refined computation types. So whereas in, in, in a language, say like Haskell, you have a type like, um, you know, ST, uh, which describes that, which says that a program may, may have, uh, uh, may read and write the state, returning some value of type T. In F star, you can enrich these types to, so that you can constrain, um, you can kind of refine the behavior of these stateful computation. So a stateful computation that could, could have a type that looks like this, that says, it's a stateful computation returning a T, but it's refined with this precondition and this postcondition. And this pre and post are, you can think of it as a, uh, in, uh, this language of indexes is up to you to pick, but this pre and this post condition could, for instance, be a, um, a horror style specification, a, a precondition on the initial heap and a post condition on the final. Okay, so um, uh, the way we're going to do this is to, to build new computation types is to start by first kind of defining monadic effects in F star. So uh, um, a, a, uh, a monad is, um, um, you can define a monad in F star as just as a value type. And then what you're gonna do, so here, here's a simple Im implementation of a, of a representation of a, of a state monad with uh, uh, whose state is just an integer. It's, uh, think of this as a function, which if you give it an input integer, it's going to compute a result and some final integer that's transforming the state while computing a result. And you, F star has a feature that lets you package up one of these monadic definitions into a new computation type using this mechanism called uh, using an effect definition. And I'm going to show you a demo of that in a second. And once you have, you define this new computation type called state in this case, um, what happens is that F star uses the monadic definition that you, the, the model that you gave underneath to, to verify your stateful code. Um, but this new computation type is, is abstract and can be implemented primitively under the hood if you like, for instance, in C by a stack in a heap. Um, once you've defined that, um, this, this effect, you can, um, uh, you can program, you don't need a do notation in F star in this case, you can program directly in F star with uh, a uh, ML style um, uh, applicative notation while programming with effects. So let's have a look at how that works. So um, this is a, uh, a file that shows how to define a, a simple state monad and package it as an effect in F star. Uh, I should say upfront that the punchline of this program is rather um, simple minded. We're only going to just define a very simple state monad that what we would really want to do eventually is to provide a way to read a, to, to reason about these programs the state in this state monad but in this demo I'm going to keep things really simple so what you can do is to define a uh, a, a state monad st that's a function from uh, s to a uh, and s um, and you can you can define it as a monad you can define a, a return combinator for it a way to promote a uh, a pure value into this uh, into the state monad by just uh, it does not transform s it takes it's a function that takes an input state s returns the result and does not change the input state that's a way to transform a pure value into a stateful computation and a way to sequence two stateful computations given an f which is a stateful function returning an a if i want to compose it with a function g that expects an a i can do that by uh, sequentially composing them while threading the state through now, uh, uh, defining this type and these two combinators uh, uh, to prove that this thing is a monad, you can actually do such a proof in F star if you want. You can prove the monad laws in F star if you like. Uh, this is saying, for instance, that the return in, is a left and a right unit for the bind and that the bind is associative. Um, you can do these proofs if you like. Um, F star does not require you to do these proofs. You may want to do them anyway to, to, to uh, uh, sanity check your definitions. And having done that, what you can then do is to package this up as a new effect in F star. And there are many uh, ways you can do this. And here, what I'm saying is, define for me a new computation type, which I'm gonna call ST with capitals. It's going to be indexed by a result type and the type of the state. Notice this type zero is a, is a detail. It's, a, it's about universes. I'm going to restrict my state in this case to be universe zero. Um, 
uh, you might want to ask me about that in Slack later if you like. Um, and the representation for this new computation type is going to be uh, uh, this value monad that I defined above, ST, with these two combinators return and bind that I defined. And having done this, this is enough for to introduce a new computation type in F star. And now I get a new computation type called ST, where these qualifiers define what I can do with it. So first, the total qualifier says that it asks F star to enforce termination of ST programs. So whenever I define an ST program, I'm going to have to prove a recursive ST program. I'm going to have to prove, for instance, that it uh, um, uh, that some metric is is decreasing on each recursive call. Uh, these two keywords, reflectable and rarefiable, allow me to, um, uh, allow I start to define a couple of coercions to move between the representation of an ST of a computation type and its underlying representation. Uh, reflection allows me to move from the, the monadic value type to the computation type, and reification allows me to go in the opposite direction. Now, with these, um, uh, having defined these. Um, um, uh, this effect, I can now define new actions for it. So I can say, here's an action to get the state. And the way I'm going to do it is to first, is to just define a, a get uh, um, combinator on the underlying monadic uh, value computation type and, and reflect it into this new effectful computation type, um, SD. And the, uh, uh, similarly for the put. Now, um, now I have get and put, and I can use them as, as effectful actions in my program. And um, there's, a, there's a, a technicality here along the way that I, I need to actually also show how to lift pure programs into my new ST effect. And uh, uh, there's a notion of sub effects, just like we have subtyping in F star, we also have sub effects in, uh, in, in F star. And this is a way to tell F star that if you have a pure computation, the way to lift it to an ST computation is by using this combinator. And once I have that, now I can write my, my imperative program um, in, um, uh, that's, that's reading and writing the state in regular uh, applicative syntax. All right, so that's, that's uh, uh, is there questions about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, may I briefly uh, comment on the kind of similarities, dissimilarities with F sharps, uh, these builders for computational expressions. Um, uh, it's a good question. I think the, what, you, what you're going to see is that uh, the, the main difference here is that F star is going to allow you to introduce computation types with a very rich indexing structure. Rather than in this example, I had a very simple computation type that's just a kind of equivalent to a to a plain vanilla state monad, but you're going to see that actually I can actually define computation types with, with a indexing structure that's uh, going to allow me to do proofs of uh, total correctness of a program. I think that's the main difference. Uh, I ask another question. Yeah. Uh, so the, you said the, we don't need to prove that the effect is actually a monad, but then uh, there's no, I mean, the effect can be anything and it does not require to be monad or the under the hood F, F star automatically proves that it is monad. So F star requires you to define um, a, if you're defining a new computation type, you need to give a, a representation of an indexed monad that supports these, uh, a return and a bind whose signatures look like this, they, they must have this shape. This is syntactically going to check that your, 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 uh, your return and bind have the, the types it expects. F star is not going to ask you to prove these, uh, the, these, uh, these equivalences. Yes. And it does not rely on them. So you can prove them if you want, but F star is not going to require you to prove them, nor does it rely on them. Okay, so those reptunit, I mean, the bonus rows are not in the internal app star or anything, right? That's right. We do not okay. we do not rely on them, but it's a good it's a good uh, you know I I recommend you to prove them if you can. Okay. Uh, so there's no problem if there's I mean if some like impact does not follow the monad rule. I think there, there is. is. No, yes. 
yeah, I think the compiler does not rely, does not, will not, for instance, uh, try to simplify your program by using one of the monad laws. Ah, okay, there, because there is no optimization. Okay, I see. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have a meta question. Mm -hmm. Do we have a special person that uh, re asks questions from the chat because there are several interesting ones? Um, I see there's lots of. Um, uh, it's hard for me to monitor the chat. Yesterday we had somebody doing that. Uh, I think Karuna was doing that yesterday. Uh, um, uh, okay, you better read it from the bottom up. And yeah. like one of the interesting yeah. questions, at least from my point of view, is whether uh, these effects are composable in F star. Yes. Um, so you can layer effects on top of each other. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to show you some examples of that in, in the coming days. But that means that composable only those effects that we explicitly said how to compose. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Another, like, yeah, a couple technical questions from the chat. One is if uh, this effect type is defined in standard library or is it something built in? into star kind of backend theory? Uh, this, uh, uh, this, this particular ST type, you mean, is it, is it there in the standard library? No, the effect type. It's ah, this ST is, is defined as type to type zero to effect. You yeah. mean this particular type effect? Yes, it is a primitive. Primitive of the language. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, this is the only place in F star where it's legal to appear actually. It's just, a, it, you should see it as just, a, it's, a, it's a sort. It's a new. It's a. It's the sort of a, of a computation type. Right. Thanks. Another technical question was about this question mark before dot reflect after st. St ah. question dot reflect. Where this question right. marks comes from. Good question. Um, so uh, in general, F star has a notation for projecting fields of a record, and uh, that notation looks like. You name the type of the uh, the constructor of the record uh, with a uh, and uh, it, with a followed by a question mark and a dot. So that's just the notation for projection. Uh, and uh, we re so we see this as a, we just reuse that notation to project the reflect operator for the computation type st. Okay, we saw it yesterday also actually in uh, when trying to. Uh, um, project a field from a, say the head of a list this is it's just a this is the projection notation in that star oh yeah thanks anyway okay i'm sorry i'm not like following the chat and retelling all the questions because i wasn't kind of assigned this job yeah well thank sorry you for, for those who yeah, I mean, sorry for those who can't kind of unmute themselves and ask their questions if I skip the questions. Another I'm one from to... the chat, uh, yeah, was about can we define like non monadic effects? I'm not sure what uh, effects are not monadic, but anyway. So the, the answer is, 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 um, well, Strictly speaking, yes. So what we're going to do is uh, a lot of what we do in FSTAR is, uh, you know, we define effects that are not, that are kind of refinements of monads, They're like various kinds of indexed monads or uh, that are technically not monads themselves, but are uh, close to monads. Uh, and that's a very common thing to do. Uh, so what we're going to do next is to, uh, is to, uh, I'm going to show you how, um, well, one, one thing that you saw here is that I wrote my little test program and I can prove that it's a, a stateful function returning an integer, but that's all I can say about it. And I want to say more. I want to say exactly how it mutates the state and uh, what, how it, what value it returns. So um, to do this, I'm going to enrich my ST type with a program logic. And the way I'm going to do it is... Um, uh, is uh, is to pick an abstraction in which I want to reason about my programs. In this case, I'm going to pick a whole logic for stateful programs, and I'm going to encode that abstraction in an indexed monad. So for um, in this particular case, I'm going to pick something called a Dijkstra monad. And what I'm going to do is to index my type 
with a weakest precondition for computations that are in this state in this uh, state type. And then I'm going to rig F star FX system to infer these uh, dextra monadic types for me. And I, I can then use the abstraction that's inferred by F star to do proofs about my program. Okay. So uh, we looked at this a little bit already in the context of Veil, um, but maybe it's worth repeating again. So a weakest precondition predicate transformer for a program, uh, if I have a program E and a WP predicate transformer W for it, what it means is that for any post condition and an initial state, I'm doing this for stateful programs. Um, if I run my weakest precondition on that post condition and an initial state, and if I can prove that, predicate, then if I run my program in the initial state, I'm going to get some result in the final state. And my post condition is going to be true for that result in final state. Okay. So the type of a WP predicate transformer is, uh, uh, is here. It's a transformer from post conditions to preconditions, where a post condition is a predicate on the result and the final state. And the precondition is a predicate on the initial state. Okay, so um, this thing is this this uh, uh, so it was Dijkstra who came up with predicate transformer semantics for programs. So this kind of predicate transformer uh, uh, for um, for state uh, packaged up into this monadic structure is something that I called a Dijkstra monad some years ago, and that that name is stuck. Um, so. Um, so that thing is a, uh, 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 this, this Dijkstra monad, the one way to understand it is that weakest precondition inference is, um, is, uh, is actually a lot like a, like a CPS transform, CPS being a continuation passing style. So, um, so I'm including here at the top the, um, the type of a weakest precondition transform of a stateful programs. And let's look for a minute at how this relates to the continuation monad. So the continuation monad is, it has a type that looks like this. It says it's a um, for some result type R. If I'm given a continuation that can, uh, that takes the result of the computation A, uh, the, you know, the, uh, it's an A arrow R, arrow R. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope this is familiar to at least some of you, the, um, the continuation monad. Uh, well, if you take the continuation monad where you take the, the, um, the answer type R to be prop, um, then, um, uh, and, and you kind of um, compose it with the, with the state monad, then what you get is, if you unfold definitions a bit, you get something that looks like this. You get a um, S arrow uh, continuation monad with result type prop with result type A cross S. Um, if you now go to um, unfold definitions, you get S arrow A cross S arrow prop arrow prop. And if you rearrange definitions, uh, uh, rearrange this arrow a little bit, uh, permuting the arguments, you get that. And this is really an ST post arrow ST pre, which is the type of STWP. So um, the generic recipe here is that WPs for, for state are uh, just the state monad transformer applied to the continuation monad with the answer type prop. Okay, and this actually you can this this recipe works for a, a, a class of effects. So you can do the same thing with, for instance, with with exceptions or combining state and exceptions. Um, uh, so uh, so what we do in F star is you we we um, define weakest precondition calculi calculi for effectful computations that we're interested in, uh, like for, for state. And then we're going to design an effect that uses this indexing structure of, the, of these um, weakest precondition monads uh, and bake that indexing structure into the computational monads to get a, a, a kind of a, a logic in which to reason about stateful computations. So let me, um, uh, let me show you quickly how that works. Um, So, um, so this here is, uh, I'm first going to define the type of my stateful WPs. So this here is a, um, this is the type that I showed you on the slides. This is a, uh, a um, uh, by the way, um, I'm, 
there's a, there's a discrepancy with the slides here. Rather than using prop, I'm using type here. Uh, prop is F stars type for uh, proof irrelevant propositions. Type is not necessarily proof irrelevant. Um, I'm uh, glossing over that distinction here. So uh, I hope that doesn't confuse too much. Um, so um, while well, we're at it again, um, yeah, maybe you can uh, can elaborate on the, the the universe and the distinction between type zero, type one, and this type polymorphic type because it pops up in the chat fairly regularly. Okay, so um, F star implements. Uh, 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 is is uh, has universe polymorphism. Uh, the type is predicative, and there's an uh, infinite hierarchy of uh, predicative universes uh, with universe polymorphism. So when you write something like type, it is actually universe polymorphic, and F star is going to infer the polymorphism for you. You're not actually going to have to write it yourself. So for instance, you can say to F star, uh, if I if I do, I, I give it a directive like this: print universes. And I uh, ask it to show me uh, the, um, the definition of this WP0. It will show me there that um, the type of WP0 is ST type zero A colon type U pound underscore. That's a, uni that's a universe uh, variable. And it's, uh, there's, uh, a, um, it has generalized the type of A to, to work over an arbitrary universe. Uh, ST has, is instead here, I'm constraining ST to be uh, in, in universe zero. So type zero is just an abbreviation for type uh, U pound zero. So universe variables in F star are, are always prefixed by U pound. Uh, so type zero, I'm restricting this, the, the type of the state to be universe zero. Uh, this is actually for some, um, uh, I, I, I could define this to be doubly universe polymorphic, and now if I ask to show uh, the type of WP0, I'll see I get two universe variables. Um, and I can even get it to print its name so those variables. Um, I guess I couldn't see the name of the variable there. So, so there's, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the directive to show me the actual name of the variable here. There's a way to see that. I've, I've forgotten what it is right now. Um, um, but this, this particular one is, is doubly universe polymorphic. It turns out that for the, the, the code that I'm doing here, uh, when I'm defining an effect here, as I'm going to do later, this effect definition cannot be doubly universe polymorphic. It must be singly universe polymorphic. That's a limitation of F star's effect system. The, the, universe, the new effects have to be singly universe polymorphic. So I don't want my definition here to be doubly universe polymorphic, which is why I'm making it type zero. I hope that answers some questions. So, uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define the type of my WPs, and uh, and this is kind of the a a a um, a kind of a pre-type of WPs. This is kind of the raw type of it. It's not actually uh, I, I need to constrain the type of WPs further, and in particular, I need to constrain it to those predicate transformers that are actually monotonic. And now I'm going to define the type of WPs are in fact WP zeros that happen to be monotonic. And monotonicity here means that if I have, if I apply my WP to a, um, to a post condition P1 that is stronger than P2, then what I get is a precondition that is correspondingly stronger than if I were to apply the weakest precondition to P2. So I need this notion of monotonicity over my, my WPs. And I'm going to, uh, uh, then restrict the class of WPs that are expressible in my system to, to only the monotonic ones. Okay. Um, now um, I can define um, um, uh, monadic returns and binds over this WP structure. And um, this is work. So it's saying if I have an, an, an A, I can compute a WP for a pure computation returning an A by just proving the post condition on the, the, the value that I'm returning and the state that has been unchanged. Uh, this is just kind of a, a CPS in some sense of the, of the computational state monad that we saw earlier. And I can do the same to define a bind on WPs. And now I get a, a, a bind over WPs. Now, 
what I'm going to do is to define a representation type. And this is kind of the, the, the I think, the main interesting bit. So um, I'm going to define a, st a, uh, a state monad from S0, some state, to A cross ST, some, some final uh, result in some final state. But I'm going to refine this monad with a WP that corresponds to this pure WP. So I'm going to say that, you know, uh, uh, my representation for this this uh, uh, for this new computation type is going to be en enriched with this new WP structure that I just defined. Um, so uh, now, what what happens is that if I'm going to do a, every time I have a, a an operation on my computational structure, I'm going to reflect the uh, semantics of that computational operation into the semantics of my specificational monad. So if I'm going to do a return um, computationally, the semantics of this at the level of specifications is going to be a return into the, the WP monad. So the slogan here in some sense is that the WP of the return is the return of the WP. Okay, and I can, and, and the type here tells me that. Similarly, if I sequentially compose two computational um, uh, two, two stateful computations, the action on the on their specifications is a sequential composition of their specifications. So again, here, the, the way to see it is that the WP of a bind is the bind of the WPs. Okay, and um, here, that's what this tells me. So the type tells me that the, uh, the specification of the sequentially composed computations is this, the sequential composition of their specifications. You can also define a notion of, sub, of subsumption on these um, new computation types. I can I can say if I have a um, a a, a um, an F whose WP is WPF, I can um, change its computation type, its index to be WPG, so long as I can prove that WPG is actually stronger than WPF. So in a way, like I, I can replace the weakest precondition of a, of a computation with another predicate transformer that does not have to be the weakest. It can be something stronger than it. Um, once I've done that, I can, just as I did before, I can turn this into an effect in F star using the same keywords that I did before. And this time, notice in, in addition to the return and bind, I also gave F, F star this subsumption operator to say, uh, this allows F star to apply subsumption on um, computation types, this particular computation type implicitly. As before, I have the same uh, the same uh, mechanism to lift pure computations into um, into this this state effect. And now, uh, where previously, if you see previously, what I did here on um, on uh, uh, on this with my basic state monad, when I defined a get. I was only able to give a rather simple type to get, meaning that get just returns the, the uh, uh, value of type state. It didn't tell you it returns to you the actual current state. But now that I have a richer indexing structure, I can actually give a precise specification to get to say that, well, get is a function that returns a value of type ST, given that the type of the state is ST, that's the second index. But now I have the specification for it that says uh, the weakest precondition of get is, um, if you run get in an initial state S0 and you want to prove some post condition P about it, it's sufficient to prove the post condition P on the pair S0, S0. And uh, likewise for put, I can also give it a, one of these precise specifications that say, well, um, if I run put in some initial state, I don't care what that initial state is and I want to prove some post condition about it. Well, uh, it's sufficient to prove the post condition on unit and the state that was the, the final state of the program, the state that this program, uh, uh, the, the state to which you changed um, uh, using a, a, a put. So these weakest precondition specs are, are, are great for computing verification conditions and so on, but they're a little bit they're, uh, you know, uh, unwieldy for writing, for, for humans to write specifications. So what you can do is to then um, uh, define a, a derived form that says, well, I'm going to actually write whole triple specs with preconditions and post, -condi post conditions of this particular form. And I have a way, given a precondition and a post condition, to turn that into a weakest precondition. And the way that I'm going to do that is, well, if, I want a, if I'm given a pre and a post and I want a weakest precondition, well, um, well, I want a predicate transformer, I should say. 
then the way to do that is to, to get this following predicate transformer. If I have a initial state S0 and I want to prove some post condition K, well, uh, prove the precondition on S0. And then to prove the post condition K, you can do that in a context where you can assume the Hoar post condition post on the initial state, the result, and the final state. And that kind of gives you a way to package this up as a, as a uh, whole triple type. And finally, with all this in place, you can now start doing proofs about your imperative programs or state manipulating programs. And here is a, a proof of, of double. So it says double is a program that returns unit. And if the state is an integer, then the final state S1 is the sum of the initial states S0. So, um, uh, it's a tiny program, but this shows you how to sort of build from the ground up a program logic for reasoning about uh, stateful programs in a whole logic um, using F star's effect system. Um, just before wrapping up, I want to say that um, there's nothing particularly special about this whole logic. Um, you could pick any abstraction to prove properties about your program. And if you're curious, you can see in the course notes, uh, there's a sample here that shows how you can, um, uh, rather than picking a whore logic, you can you can choose to reason about your program in a abstraction suitable, say, for information flow control. So rather than writing pre preconditions and post conditions, this example develops a, um, a an index state monad returning an A with where these indexes tell you that uh, these are the memory locations that this program wrote, these are the locations that it read. And these are the flows that were present in the program, the information flows um, that were present in the program in the memory. And uh, you can reason about programs in this abstraction if that's what you want. So the choice of abstraction is up to you. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I wanted to get to today. So um, I, I, that's a lot of stuff I know uh, that I uh, presented to you. Uh, do um, I think the, the way to absorb these things is to really uh, Followed through um, in a uh, um, in an editor with F star, stepping through the examples, seeing if you can make sense of what all the types are telling you, and making small changes and seeing um, if um, um, uh, if you can decipher what's going on. And do ask questions. Be, I hope we have a still a minute or two. Um, and if not, I'll uh, be happy to take your questions on Slack. Thanks. Uh, again, several questions and yeah, mostly technical ones. My personal curiosity, could you uh, comment on the difference between uh, defining effects like proper way with layered effect keyword and just effect abbreviation? Right. Okay. So effect abbreviation is, uh, is uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, a transparent definition. It's saying a, uh, a, a hor st is is can be unfolded to uh, this this uh, sta to the definition on the right hand side. A layered effect is is kind of defining a new abstraction. This uh, um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's kind of a new a new effect definition. So uh, that's the difference. You can see it maybe an analogy is like with defining a a new inductive type using the type keyword, or defining an abbreviation using that. Right, thanks. Yeah, on these keywords and types, inductive in particular. Okay, we have several questions about, uh, yeah, props. What is prop and how it's uh, connected to refinement? And in particular, or in general, what can go into refinement inside this curly braces used to specify refinement? What kind of what are these expressions and what are their type and if it's somehow connected to prop or not so and i yeah again I, the distinction between this unit uh, yeah refined with some properties and prop as a type right. yeah that, that's kind of uh, a lot but it, it all goes on and gone in the okay chat. so uh, i I answered questions on Slack yesterday about what is allowable in a refinement in terms of uh, decidability and total functions and so on. Um, there is also a um, uh, a section in the tutorial about uh, about prop and uh, proof of relevance, 
And uh, I, I, uh, I think I mean, that's, that's one place to go to, to read about these things. The, the short version is that prop is, a, um, is defined in F star to be a ref any refinement of unit is a prop. So um, uh, yeah, I, I encourage you to read about it, and if um, and if it's if it's not clear, you should you should ask more. Um, about refinements again, maybe personal curiosity. I remember mm -hmm. like the old days when yeah, one of the first papers on Star, it presented a type theory without full dependent types, but with four kinds of yeah. types. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so these uh, refinements were a particular kind, and what are their types nowadays in modern F star? So yes, so, so in in about 2011, we had a, uh, uh, the version of F star at the time was very different than the version it is today. Um, uh, the refinements are just of type. Uh, so a uh, it, so if you write a um, this P is just of type type. And um, uh, so it's, it's, it, you can form a refinement over, um, and, and X is in scope for it. So you can put any type in a refinement, including things like, you know, I can write a refinement like, um, you know, for all X, um, for all Y, um, F of X is for Y. But well, that's still, I believe, a prop. In prop because for all the result is a prop. Uses. The result is a prop. So okay, so this guy is a prop. In this case, this is a prop. But I, I could have also written. I don't know. I can. Uh, the, so so the way this is defined. So I should say, the way for all is defined. So uh, so for all in F star is defined here. So uh, this is the definition of for all in F star. It's the one that you uh, have been writing using the for all symbol, um, but it's defined as uh, as as that. And uh, squash. So if I unfold definitions a little bit, this guy is equal to It's equal to that. So it's a unit refinement where the, the refinement formula is just a type. Okay, and uh, actually this this uh, this the G tote is 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 actually irrelevant. You can you can just see it as uh, as that. That's a synonym. So it's that. So what is the difference between this unit refinement and an existential in meaning or same. So uh, uh, an existential is 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 different. Uh, an existential is a um, so uh, exists is defined this way. It's a uh, an exists is giving you a witness for um, uh, a validity of a given uh, proposition. So uh, or predicate. So exists is defined like this. So if you if you if I unfold definitions again, it's it's defined like. Um, um, so it's so the uh, there is it, it, I, I see your question the way I interpret your question is that uh, one way to see this as as an exist is that there is an an, an existential for the the uh, uh, the proof object for the refinement formula. And that is one level of existential, but that's not the existential in, 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 in that where uh, that the exist formula in F star is, is concerned with. It, the exist is, is buried inside it. There is a um, uh, there is a witness for the validity of P that is sort of uh, 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 if you were to materialize the proof of uh, a refinement formula, the witness for the exists would be the first component of that proof.
So if you write this uh, this squash of just any type, mm -hmm. you can yes. Yeah. So, so how is that? Is that like is it the same thing as there exists an inhabitant of this type? There exists an inhabitant of this type. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, exists an inhabitant of this type in, uh, it turns out that the refinement logic in that star is classical. So there exists an inhabitant of this type in the presence of uh, classical axioms. Yeah, well, nobody else asks. We had uh, yeah, a couple or one more technical question is in the chat about uh, the keywords requires and ensures and what are they uh, yeah. stand for? A syntactic sugar for? Uh, they are actually they are completely optional. They, I just use them to help you read, so they, they do not mean anything. They are just uh, you know they are uh, uh, tags to assist with reading. They do not mean anything. So they're essentially ID function. Yes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>